It's time for another video. So today we're going to talk about convergence tools for evaluating ideas in food product development. We spent a good number of videos in the past week talking about creative idea um, generation, ideation, and so on. And we visited a wide variety of tools from uh, Doug Hall, from a number of different organizations and we've just reflected on the imagination process that's a very divergent process and we have generated tons and tons of ideas but now we need to go through some sort of convergence where we are actually starting to stage gate and eliminate some of those ideas from the brainstorming or the ideation processes that we've done because Many of those ideas may be wonderful and fantastic, but we need to now start to ask questions about feasibility, about saleability, about meaningfulness in the marketplace. So we're going to use some convergence tools today. At the end of this video, you will be able to justify the use of Doug Hall's Meaningful unique Uniqueness Matrix, and he does have some proprietary tools that we'll discuss. Um, We'll also apply the Fort Woodlock equation for evaluating product value. In some cases, it's very much a monetary question. We'll also utilize some SWOT analysis tools for evaluating food products. Use DFVI matrices for evaluating innovation index on food products and reflect on the relevance of each of these different tools and the need for some intuition on top of the analysis. So we've talked about Doug Hall before and his uh, different innovation tool kits at Eureka Ranch. One of his most commonly quoted quotes is, if it isn't meaningful and unique, it had better be cheap. And so Doug Hall, as an innovation guru, really is out there uh, pushing the concept that innovation and product development should be driven by meaningfulness to the consumer and uniqueness within the marketplace so that it doesn't just get lost among the clutter of the thousands upon thousands of products that are out there. So how do you define meaningful and unique? Well, he does have a lot of different questions that he asks and Doug Hall at Eureka Ranch has a number of proprietary tools, but a lot of this comes uh, 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 when we're doing feedback and, um, giving insight to the different student projects or the different industry clients that come to us, we are often asking all sorts of different questions. So what's the relative advantage or degree of innovation that we're seeing in this project? When we say relative advantage, we want to see clear, meaningful benefits within that product and not just it's another, it's another barbecue sauce, because pardon me, I've seen hundreds of barbecue sauces, but What's the relative advantage of this product? Why would someone pick this product over your competitor? What degree of innovation are we seeing in this product? So is this something that's quite transformative and going to revolutionize the consumer's experience? Or is this just an incremental innovation, maybe a new flavor combination or a new label? There's, there's, there's roles for that, but what is that degree of innovation? Are you the first, in order to market is another important one, are you the first to market or are you taking advantage of other companies' mistakes and making improvements on that or are you just a strict up copycat? Because in many cases copycats are not that uncommon and typically if you're a copycat then you had better bring either a major brand advantage or you are going to be producing that product in a much cheaper format. How about marketing effort? Are you able to do a lot of pre-marketing development and promotion and advertising? How about other aspects? When it comes to understanding the impact of this product, how much of a social or behavioral change is it going to be both, is your product going to deliver social and behavioral change or is it going to require social and behavioral change to adapt to using this product? If you are conferring a beneficial social and behavioral change, then there's going to be ease on uptake. Whereas if you are requiring a major social and behavioral change that is 
overtly complex, then it's going to become detrimental in terms of repeat sales. Understanding your market segment and understanding how intense your competition is and how, how much regulatory space there is and how much barrier to entry there is, is going to be critical. Last but not least, in some of these questions that are frequently asked, are there cultural differences in the different marketplaces that you're going to be entering? So, for example, if you're trying to sell a product in Eastern Canada, where we're situated, you may have a very different um, scenario in terms of innovation praxis if you were to try and enter, let's say, the Vietnamese marketplace. There's very uh, established market norms within different geographies around the world, and so you need to be really reflective on that. This slide really is intended to represent the fact that you've got to think really robustly about all sorts of different market-oriented questions when going through that ideation process and, and, and use that. All these different models that I'm going to present uh, presently are iterations of these questions. So Doug Paul's Meaningfully Unique Index is a proprietary tool that he has developed through Eureka Ranch. And it's uh, one of them is called the Merwin Truth Teller. And he has also one called the Wow Factor Analysis. But the idea is that using an, an um, artificial intelligence-based matrix, he asks all sorts of different questions about how new the concept is, how frequently a consumer or a customer would be interacting with this product in terms of uh, frequency of touch points. So for example, if a product is used once a year, let's say it's a holiday food versus something that they'd be consuming on a daily basis, that's going to really indicate the importance of the market share. How much pain and inconvenience is this product solving? So is this product making a meaningful impact on the consumer that's choosing this product in a way that it's eliminating a pain point or um, eliminating a problem that this uh, consumer is having on a daily basis. I think of one example, uh, it, last week was CL and the CL pitch competition that was hosted by my friends at uh, the Niagara College Innovation Center, the winning pitch was a waffle that hid vegetables in it. Uh, it's called Snobos, and it happened to be a spin-off from uh, CIFST student competition that was done in 2018. Um, but the idea being the pain point is, if I'm a parent and I want my kid to eat more vegetables, it's often an uphill battle, but I can get my kid to eat waffles. They enjoy that sort of uh, bakery type breakfast product, and I'm solving a major pain point for parents, which is kids don't like vegetables. Um, so it's if you can really hit on a touchstone that really hits a key pain point in the demographic that you're trying to target with your product, then that's a really, really clear advantage for your product. Second, uh, another, another line right below it is how much of an advantage and benefit statement can this product make? And so as I just walk out there and say, it is new and innovative versus this product performs 50% better than the competition, or you will have a much greater satisfaction rating from consuming this product. How clear is that advantage? Because if you if you are just another product in the in the maze of thousands of products that are out there, then it's hard to differentiate. But again, a clear advantage statement against the close competitors helps quite a bit. How much does that benefit differentiate from others in the market? Is it a revolutionary benefit? Is it just an incremental benefit? How are you expressing that? And so that sort of covers off those last two points. And, and then the, how do customers define the price and value? So inevitably, it, we will have a slide deck talking about pricing of food products and how do you set the suggested retail price? Do you price up or do you price down when it comes to defining that price? When you walk out there with that suggested retail price, how do customers feel about that? Do they feel it's a really incredible value for the money that they're spending? Or are they just sort of indifferent and say, you know what, it's the same price as everything else and therefore 
whatever the sales promotion is this week, I'm going to buy that product. You want to make sure that the price is set at a meaningful point and that you're not just diluting price to capture value because we'll talk about break-even analysis in another slideshow too, but uh, oftentimes I see small businesses undercutting their pricing structure to try and attract customers where if they actually set the price higher, they may be helping to find the value proposition for their customers where they see this as a premium product and that it's worth paying a dollar or two more for this product because of that exceptional value that is being portrayed in that product. And that leads to profitability. So part of the Merwin Truth Teller tool and the wow factor analysis is that they're using what's called the Fort Woodlock decomposition analysis. And I actually want to walk you through this because these are some of the other questions that I'm often asking when giving feedback to students or clients in their projects. What do you think your typical market's going to be? And so Fort Woodlock really is meant to be giving an estimate on annualized sales. It could be in net or gross quantity, but what you first need to figure out is how many final decision makers, how many people are in the market that you think you're going to be tapping into. We talked about sourcing market data in a different um, unit in this class, but how big is your market? Um, it was uh, talking to a barbecue sauce maker earlier today, and they were like, well, we have, the potential of selling about 100 bottles every every weekend. And I'm like, fantastic. So that's how many people are buying in. You have 100 people buying in times 50 weekends, let's say. So 50 weekends times 100, you are going to sell 50 times 100 is 5,000 units. That's how many final decision makers you have. If you need to figure out how big your marketplace is, is for this. In some cases, you might be looking more abstractly at your final decision makers. Maybe you're looking at, I don't know, let's say the um, expat Iranian population in southern Ontario. I, th I throw that number out there because, as you know, my family is uh, Iranian and um, within the greater Toronto, southern Ontario uh, GTA region, there's maybe about uh, 250,000 Iranians living across that entire space. And let's say all of them are going to be considering your product, but maybe only 10% of that is going to be jumping in on that idea. If they were to walk in and see a point of sale promotion on this product, maybe only 10% is going to buy that product. You need to think about what percent of people who see that product are actually going to jump on the idea. And again, these numbers are rough. I'm not a marketing expert, I'm a chemist, but you need to have these sorts of numbers in mind. Then you need to know your revenue per purchase and you could put this in gross revenue or net revenue. So uh, again, in general, um, most people put in manufacturer's suggested retail price. I'm actually gonna give you a calculator to play around with these numbers so that you can have some fun with it. Um, then you'd want to know your repeat rate. So this is where it's really critical. I can't stress this enough to the students that I work with, but I often ask them, how frequently is a customer going to buy this product again? Is this a single eventing product or is this something that's going to become a staple in their, in their um, cupboard? And honestly, there's, there's still a role for eventing products, things like seasonal, products, birthday cakes, uh, turkeys, and so on that are served at Thanksgiving. But the better you can make that repeat sales and turn that product into a routinely consumed product, the more net volume you're going to have. Then, of course, you've got your repeat, your, your repeat rate and the number of repeat purchases. Are they going to repeat buy it once or twice? Or are they going to repeat buy this every single week that they go grocery shopping. So you need to think about these numbers and then decide if the revenue stream is going to be the same or if you're going to uh, increase your, 
your uh, initial purchase price versus your repeat purchase price. So sometimes, for example, that initial purchase price is going to be decreased to try and uh, attract people to the product, but then you'll see an incremental increase in the purchase price. Um, so an initial sales to get people hooked on the product and then put the product, or adjust that product pricing. I don't recommend doing that. I recommend setting your product pricing and leaving it solid unless you have major force from your retailer to have some sort of promotional pricing cycle on that product. In general, for small entrepreneurs, I say fix your price and leave it there. So what on earth does this look like? Well, I'm giving you the University of Maine, actually, um, as you know, I mentioned this before, Doug Hall is an adjunct professor at the University of Maine in innovation practice, and he has provided through the University of Maine a modified Fort Worth Law calculator, and I've provided that to those of you who are following along with this course in Blackboard. Play around with it. It's fun. You can punch in all sorts of different numbers and make different assumptions and get estimates on how much revenue you would be generating from your product based off of different sales volumes. It's a ton of fun and again, using all those numbers that I just described in the previous slide. What are some of the other matrices that we often hear about? The SWOT matrix. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, SWOT, stands for SWOT, and Quite frequently, this is a matrix that we hear about because it's so common. It was developed by um, Stanford University, and they went about evaluating how business decisions were made, and they identified that typically business decision-making is based off of what are the positives in the scenario, what are the negatives in the scenario, and what are things that are controlled internally within the organization versus what are external to the organization. And they built out this matrix. The idea being strengths are internal positives, things like what does what does the team bring? What equipment do you have? What innovation, um, intellectual property do you have within your organization? Every organization has weaknesses too. Do you have uh, volume capacity or production capacity issues? Do you have, um, are you missing equipment that would make innovations possible? Do you have to develop partnerships instead? is getting to retail a challenge because of barriers to entry in the marketplace. Then there's all these external things, things like, um, is there a big market trend for the product that you're making that's external to your organization? Um, has there been interest in the press or marketing campaigns such as Ontario Made or Foodland Ontario encouraging people to be eating more uh, Ontario produced products? Some of these things are external that create opportunities, but they could also be threats. For example, changes in regulatory environment or requirements on uh, food safety legislation or potentially that threat could be competitors knocking off your product. This SWOT matrix is extremely common and from there there's additional layers of analysis that are often applied and oftentimes you're looking at many, many strategies where you're focusing on weaknesses and threats, or you're uh, ideally you're walking into the scenario with dominant strengths and dominant opportunities behind the concept that you're positioning in that SWOT matrix. That's the ideal scenario. I, I, in, in reality, I always discourage organizations that have a many, many strategy from moving ahead on their innovation unless it's going to be significantly cheaper. You could argue that that then becomes a strength in terms of in terms of that uh, strategy. I all I for small business I almost always say focus on uh, maxi maxi strategy for when it, coming into the marketplace with new concepts. So what on earth does this mean? If you're doing a um, SO analysis, you're looking at internal strengths and you're exploiting external opportunities. You could be using internal strengths to avoid impact of threats. You can overcome weaknesses by exploiting opportunities, or you, you can have that weakness threat. And again, I always say avoid weakness threat analysis within your concept. Avoid pushing those concepts forward. One last matrix that's uh, often used in food product development is uh, DFEI analysis. That's where we're looking at combination of desirability so how much does the human element 
uh, drive forward this concept versus feasibility. So is it possible to make this product? Oftentimes I have entrepreneurs walking in saying, I'd like to make this product and I need all these wacky fangled pieces of equipment that are not actually available or they are so costly that it's not accessible to the organization. So thinking about the technical feasibility on that concept. Other times it's a food safety issue where someone comes in and says, I would like to have unpasteurized liquid eggs in a carton. And you just shake your head saying, this is, this is impossible to do from a food safety perspective, unless we are applying a whole whack of technology, it's not going to be feasible. And in many cases, that business element, the cost of doing business doesn't justify it. Is it going to drive enough sales within that product range to justify potentially the technical investment that's necessary? If we see a really strong central element of a balance between desirability, feasibility, and viability, then we say this is a good innovation and move forward. So we do often see unbalanced models where we see, for example, really desirable product, but low feasibility. So not technically able to make it within the context of the manufacturing space we're in. Or in other cases, we see highly desirable and feasible products, but companies coming in with no business plan. I've, I've worked with clients who come in with, with products and they've said, we're going to take over Nestle. And I just shake my head saying, um, show me your business numbers. And they're like, well, it's a great product. And I'm like, no, show me your business numbers. Show me what you what you anticipate your annual, annual sales are going to be. Show me your two market strategy. And there's no business model in place. Other times you've got really great feasible and viable products, but very little desirability. I often see this when companies come and take a waste stream from their processing and repurpose it into another product. And while it may be completely feasible and a great business case to reduce food waste, the product oftentimes has questionable sensory attributes. And I'm fearful that there's not going to be repeat sales on that product because the product often tastes horrible. And people come in with this cognitive bias saying, this is a wonderful product. It's making so much money and the projections are fantastic. And that cognitive bias clouds the fact that it's not a desirable product. So as you're going about doing product development, really think about the overlay of these possible matrices. Each matrix has a very different outcome. And you may find that your product scores really well in one, but really poorly in another. And as such, you need to reflect on why that is. And think about the balance between all these different matrices. So my last point that I'm going to leave you with, when I work with student projects and they come in and they say, oh, we're going to do a product development concept, I often ask them the question, why do you want to do this? Why is this meaningful to you? And meaningful for students is very different than meaningful for commercialization. Many times students come in, and they say, I really want to make this product because I want to go and work for this company. And this company has values that I really aspire to, or the company is in my neighborhood, and I'd really like to live close to my family. That is meaningful. And so oftentimes when I am working with students on projects, I will approve products that are meaningful, but are not unique, because the meaningful for a student is very different. And they can walk into that company that perhaps they're aspiring to work at and have a portfolio of project work that they can walk into that uh, they can walk into that interview and say I really aspire to your company I have something to show and the product is actually the student and being meaningful in their work and unique in their work has great intent for the human resources pipeline of the company that they'd like to work for commercialization very different story and I I'm often working with students in projects and it's funny because they'll say well the way you the way you attack the client is very very different than how you deal with us as students and that's very true 
the moment that dollars and cents are coming into play and companies are expending major effort, I want to make sure that the product is going to be commercializable. And in this case, the product is not a person or a student or a graduate. The product is an actual product that will go on the shelf. So I use very different approaches to what meaningful and uniqueness is depending on the scenario that I'm working in. Anyways, enough of, enough of this for now. I want you as uh, those of you who are students in this class to really think about how you're applying these different matrices. There are a lot more tools out there and those of you who are following along in Blackboard have found that I've provided a wide variety of different calculators and different articles to um, go along with these topics. But again, always ask good questions and have fun trying out these tools as you think about uh, convergence on the ideation that you've done for a new product development. Take care and we'll talk to you soon.